I believe Bitcoin will be the reserve currency of the world. And if you hold Bitcoin for any four year period, you have a 96.06% .06 chance of a positive return. If you hold it for one year, your probability of positive return is 70.3%, with the average return being 90%. AI, I believe, could be the only thing that potentially kicks the can down the road of the dollar fiat collapse for another 10 to 20 years. As we move to the digital transformation of money and the exchange of value in a global world, there is one asset class that does it better than others. That happens to be Bitcoin. You can be apathetic and yeah, this is how the world's going to continue to go. And you can also shake your fist, buy Bitcoin and put it in self-custody. The dollar becomes so big, we have to protect the dollar in so many places that we just gorge ourselves on dollars until we become a 500 pound person on the couch that can't move. And that's what ends up killing us. Gold won't be the winner at the end of that. Bitcoin will be the winner. I'm really hopeful for this level playing field, this new economic constitution being instituted by Bitcoin, where we all have the same rules that we play on. It's the same playing field. We have one referee, and that is the Bitcoin protocol. So when these resets happen, we reset as a human race back down that triangle of our needs. And what that does is it levels the playing field. It removes the excess of all of the things that we don't need. And that allows us to reset on a new standard. When that new standard is Bitcoin, we then begin to trade onto this foundational layer based upon our merit and not upon our debt. It's the great debt jubilee. Believe it happens either we willingly choose this or it happens via war. I want to talk about before we get into Bitcoin and all, all the interesting stuff, I want to talk be, with you about your journey from Swan to now simply Bitcoin, but maybe also where you're coming from, what's your background, uh, how did you get to Swan, and uh, how did you then get off of Swan, and what, what did you learn from that journey? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm happy to share about that. And uh, I recently saw you know a tweet from you about how you're kind of doing this now full time. And I think that's kind of the goal and the trajectory for me as well. So let me just uh, give a broad background of just me and who I am and uh, my sort of experiences, because I think it really shapes my worldview. Um, my parents, as uh, I mentioned before, um, they were not college educated. They joined the military when they were 17 and 18 years old. I was actually born in Germany during the Gulf War um, in Frankfurt, Germany, and um so my, my early childhood started off international and then we came back to the United States and then they worked uh, blue collar jobs. They worked at the post office. And, um, you know, from there, I was a pretty good athlete um, and uh, I, I had this ability to learn. And so I ended up going to this school called William and Mary, which is the second oldest university to Harvard University. Um, and there's a lot of really smart people there. And I, I wasn't one of them. I, I learned pretty quick. Um, I could run fast, uh, hit people, do that sort of thing on the football field. Um, but these people were really bright and they really expanded the idea that I had around education and academics. And so I learned to learn. I got three degrees at Wayman Mary. I completed one in marketing, one in finance, and then one in process management and consulting. And then I really had this passion for entrepreneurship. One of the guys that I met there uh, was a really gifted entrepreneur. He was one of the creators of the Norton Antivirus, a former NASA scientist. He created the first mobile app company called AppForge. He sold to Oracle in 2007. I think he sold too early. Um, but he said, Dante, while you're here, like, don't take any electives and then like really think about getting into something on the ground floor. And so I just came out to Indiana with a bad knee. Uh, my Honda Accord with 280,000 miles on it. God bless Betsy. She still has uh, 320,000 miles on her and she's still driving every day. Uh, those 03 Accords, they just don't make them like that anymore. Um, and I came out to Indiana with a bad knee thinking I might play football. And there was this guy who said, you could work for me while you figure out what you want to do with your life. And uh, he sold his company to Salesforce for $2.3 billion after taking them public. And that's how I got started in the entrepreneurship game. And so then I've been on the ground floor of startups for 11 years, um, venture backed, private equity backed startups from co-founding one of my own to being an early employee. And so I've been able to do everything there is under the sun at an early stage company from sales to growth to product to you name it, fundraising. And so 
I joined Swan uh, pretty early on. I was one of the, I think, I don't know, the number four member of the Swan private team uh, where I was working with high net worth individuals um, privately to help them navigate their their journey in, in buying, holding, and securing Bitcoin. And then this opportunity came when we were at Swan. We saw all of these businesses that were creating Swan accounts. And uh, there was no one really leading the Swan business team, even though we had the ability to onboard businesses. And so that was kind of my last role in assignment for the last 18 months at Swan, uh, which was onboarding businesses and companies uh, onto Bitcoin. And so we have, you know, uh, Swan, we had a few thousand companies that had Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, you hear about the big names like MetaPlanet or MicroStrategy or similar scientific, but there's lots of plumbers, single member LLCs, people that hold, you know, Bitcoin in um, a retirement account, you know, um, an entity that's non-taxable um, with real estate and other things. And so I worked with a lot of these people to help them navigate that. And January 11th, it was like, hey, let's start creating some content to be irrelevant around ETFs. And um, I just started to want to, you know, be me and have some fun with it uh, with some of those videos. And they kind of took off. And so that was like my journey at Swan. And so here, here I'll give you this, Robin. The, the biggest insight that I had at Swan was when I was doing the Daily Show and I would put out this email of, hey, send me an email uh, with any questions you have about Bitcoin. Email daily at swanbitcoin.com. And when I was doing that, I was getting 30 to 40 emails a day. It was crazy. Um, and so it was just so surprising to me that people would open up, share their life story, you know, everything that was going on. I'm like, whoa, OPSEC, like you're, you're giving away way too much information here. But it was interesting to see that people had these needs. Some of them people buying their first Bitcoin ever to people who were really far down the rabbit hole, maybe 10 figure net worth but didn't have a place where they felt like they could share and get real expertise and advice. And so that's my thing with Columbus right now. Um, I'm, I have this community where people can connect and coll collaborate. And it's an online digital community, a third space between LinkedIn and Twitter. And I'm creating videos again with the Simply Bitcoin team, which is awesome. My show is called Bitcoin Simply. So hopefully that gives a breakdown of what I've been doing, uh, my journey to and through Swan and what I'm doing now. Uh, really, really cool. I love that. Also, that there's so many questions. I, I get that a lot also with, with the newbies coming in. Um, but as we discussed the first time we you, you coming on my show, it was right at that time. Uh, and you were not sure if you stay in Bitcoin, as I remember. Um, why did you ultimately decide to actually stay in Bitcoin and, and commit to, to the Bitcoin community? Wow. One, it was... Um... I think it was really just the outpouring of the community. I think after making The Daily Show, it just surprised me um, how many people would reach out to me. They'd find my email or they'd comment on YouTube posts from all around the world of like, hey, we miss you. We miss what you're doing. So that was a big piece of it as well. But then when I think really long term about the dynamics of Bitcoin and I think the shift that we're going into, you know, this digital transformation of money, as Michael Saylor calls it. Um, I really think that this is an incredible platform to be in long term, and it has so many implications with so many unrealized opportunities that can branch off from Bitcoin moving forward. One of my, you know, one of these great books that I love, I have this bookshelf behind me. Everyone always looks at the books that I have here, but it's the Everything Store by Brad Stone about Jeff Bezos. And he goes to his boss at the time at D.E. Shaw. And uh, when he was there, because he was one of their best employees, one of their best traders, and he goes to his boss and he goes, hey, boss, I'm leaving. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm going to sell books. He's like, why would you ever do that? That's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. He's like, well, there's this thing called the Internet. And I looked at the compound annual growth rates from the past three years, and it's over 2000 percent. So I don't know like what's going on, but. I feel like this is a good place to be. And I feel like books is a good place to start. And so he started with books and he told his boss, hey, I'm leaving, left the best job, was the best employee, the brightest person at the firm. Uh, and they actually created email. They actually created the Gmail equivalent. Um, and they created a lot of things like the browsers and D.E. Shaw was really an innovator. So Jeff Be Bezos was behind a lot of these innovations uh, that a lot of people don't even know about. 
uh, but he saw this thing on the internet that was growing so fast and it was so large. And he said, this is going to change the world. So that's kind of what I think about Bitcoin. Yeah, it's really interesting. And uh, as you also said, you're re uh, really good in, in breaking something down simply because it's, <laughs> I love that you're now at Simply Bitcoin and, and your show is also the Simple Signal, I think it's called. Uh, re really, really cool. Um, where do you see uh, concrete? Like, where are we going the next decade? Like, I am 100% with you. That's why I also committed this podcast to do it, the daily Bitcoin podcast, the next 10 years, because I just see the massive potential in Bitcoin. Uh, and I want to be as deeply involved as possible in this community. Uh, but what's your what's your vision? What's your uh, outlook for Bitcoin over the next 10 years? And what can we look forward to? Yeah, so I think we are at the end of these long secular trends. So you have these major trends that happen in the world that are 100 year trends. These are trends like the industrial revolution or the introduction of power or light or these sorts of things into economies broadly. And so since we've introduced, you know, power in the car and some of these sorts of things from the beginning of the industrial revolution, these things have sort of been democratized and commoditized, right? So much so that like, it's not a feat anymore when you get on a plane and you fly across the world in a few hours and you pay a few hundred dollars and it's seamless. Right. We're, we're sort of at the end of that industrial revolution that changed the world. So that's kind of one large trend that we're kind of nearing the end towards. When you also look at currencies and the evolution of currencies from, you know, the French having the global reserve currency to the UK uh, and the sterling having the global reserve currency around 1915 to 1921 before World War I and to the dollar becoming the global reserve currency in 1921 and really being solidified in 1971 and 72 with Bretton Woods. But you have this kind of 100-year trend where global currencies tend to run out of steam. And these global superpowers, here's another trend. These last you know, 300 to 500 years, when you go back to the Roman Empire um, or... Uh, let's go with uh, the, even the Russian empires or the Chinese empires, or even now the, the American empire from the early you know, 1700s, these things all have a rise and a decline. And it's interesting that we're, we're hitting all of these sort of shifts at once. And I think Bitcoin has a role to play in all of these. But I think the major thing that people misunderstand as we move into uh, the, the physical transformation of the world to the digital transformation of, world, of the world is we need, we need a medium of exchange to trade value. As humans in society, that is the number one creator of economic activities. How quickly, how easily can we transfer value? And so when that value is not exchanged physically, it has to be done digitally. And so when you think about all of the other global reserve currencies uh, or potential global reserve currencies with bricks or energy or oil or commodities or how people have stored this value in bonds or real estate or other things, as we move more and more towards a digital world in a global world, there's really one asset that does this better than any other asset. And so I just like to, in a simple way, as we move to the digital transformation of money and the exchange of value in a global world, there is one asset class that does it better than others. And uh, that happens to be Bitcoin. And so there's like a lot of shifts that are happening all at once. I think they're all colliding. It's too early to tell um, where Bitcoin plays on that stage and in what revolution it really picks up on. But I think it's got a 20% chance of... <laughs> catching the tail end of one of those, right? And so I, I, I don't know where we are in a 10-year in a cycle, but in a 50-year cycle, Bitcoin is going to be and play a major role in one of these large transformations. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, it's also interesting when we look at, like, always when I put something of long term of like 20 or 30 or 40 years, I always get those comments back. Oh, like, uh, I will be dead back then. <laughs> so so uh, try yeah. to uh, also fo focus on like 10 years. <laughs>
Oh, but people, it's interesting. people are so short-sighted, you know? That's true. Like, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it's it's like the, the one comment I, like, if I put in the title in the thumbnail 2050, I can guarantee you there are a lot of people in there like, oh, what will I do in 2050? I need it now. Like, uh, that, 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 that kind of uh, thing. And, like, I get that a lot. Uh, even with not that old people, like if if he's like eighty or ninety years old, I can understand, <laughs> but but they are not that old. But um, back to the point, it's really interesting. Also, when we now look at uh, all these deflationary forces coming into this fiat world with like AI, like this podcast, I do everything myself, and I do it daily, and uh, I hope I have a good enough quality. And this would not be possible just like three, four years ago. It's amazing that that same show would only be possible with like maybe two, three, four people that helped me bring everything together. But now I can do it myself. So like AI, remote work, all those uh, trends that actually bring costs down a lot and bring this competitive thing uh, across the globe. So you can like sit in a Argentina, uh, but work for an American company and all those things. Uh, I think like Bitcoin is just like one of the really important bustles uh, to that. So like it's a really interesting time where we are in and uh, it, it could play a massive role. And then when we also have a deflationary money and not just like inflationary money, as Jeff Poof says, like, where are you measuring from? Not from zero, but you have to calculate the productivity growth in. It's, it's interesting uh, to see that. Uh, uh, how do you see AI and, and all the other trends uh, moving into this? Well, I think AI has a massive role to play. And AI, I believe, could be the only thing that potentially kicks the can down the road of the dollar fiat collapse for another 10 to 20 years. Because when you think about GDP um, or growth of societies, they're really measured in like a couple things. It's like productivity, it's the growth of the population overall, and then just the, you know, I guess economic output or the amount of money that's stimulated through that economy. Those things like kind of all roll up into increasing GDP. And so with population, you know, they're, they're kind of flat to down and almost everywhere in the world. Uh, people just aren't having kids except like me and my neighbors, I guess. There's like 13 kids between our three houses, um, four of my own. It's just a wild, wild life we live. But um, AI, though, one of the things that it's going to do is it's going to displace physical people in the labor force for digital workers in the labor force. And the exponential cost of an AI worker, I was listening to the open AI um, uh, CTO talk in the recent token 2049 conference that they had. And he said a million tokens when they started a few years ago, cost um, $36 per million tokens. And he said, now we're at 25 cents per million tokens and soon to be almost at a cent per million tokens. And so when you think about that, when you think about an employer that is trying to keep up with the cost of inflation or trying to meet the demands of producing output and um, economic goods for their customers, they almost have no choice but to hire this increasingly cheaper and more capable employee for their company. And so I believe that that's going to have a massive impact on GDP depending on how it's regulated and how it gets incorporated into businesses. And so I think that may be the last thing that keeps the dollar fiat system from collapsing. Because one of the ways that you can grow out of your debt problem, our $35 trillion debt problem, is by inflating it away or becoming that much more productive. So the A AI has the potential of kicking the dollar collapse down, down the road. I don't know that it happens. Um, I, I, I'm like, I'm holding my breath a little bit. But then also on the AI side, if we're smart, if we regulate it properly, um, it has the opportunity to um, cause us to um, exponentially grow our energy supply. So that is um, creating more infrastructure, pouring in more dollars towards nuclear. You just saw Three Mile Island with Microsoft and a big deal that they had to uh, revive that nuclear plant. 
Um, you're seeing other nuclear plants come back online. You're seeing this um, massive shift in um, you know hydrocar hydrocarbon transformation. If you listen to any of the Doomberg podcasts, um, you're seeing solar. Um, you know the the cost for solar panels and solar energy is like diving off of a cliff. Battery storage isn't quite there, um, but AI could be the thing that pushes us over the edge towards getting those capabilities and kicking the fiat can down the road. But inevitably, it all ends in the same place. You you get too big, like that's the whole dollar milkshake versus uh, dollar obesity theory. Like in a nutshell, is the expansion of the dollar and the growth um, of 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 all of this money being in the system is going to be the thing that kills it inevitably. What is uh, we, we talked about that before, and I saw it also that you have it as a pin tweet, and I I heard that word uh, already, but I never really researched it. What is the dollar milkshake theory, and what is the dollar obesity uh, theory, and and how do they differentiate? Yeah, they're they're kind of two in the same, but with. Uh, different outcomes or different proposed outcomes. So the dollar milkshake theory was coined by uh, Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital um, in about 2018. He started coming on Raul Powell's podcast, uh, Real Vision, and started talking about this idea that uh, the dollar will only continue to strengthen over time because 87% of global trade happens in the dollar. Um, you have a large majority of institutions, banks, um, intermediaries that use the dollar to settle for trade, and then they go to other currencies after. And then you have the euro dollar market, which all that means is the the euro uh, the euro dollar market is they can't actually create dollars themselves. The Fed's the only one that can do it. So they post U.S. dollar collateral and create dollars out of thin air. So basically, even the euro market itself is propped up by dollar denominated assets. And so when the dollar rises in price um, or it gets stronger, uh, this creates more pressure for everyone around the globe um, because their dollar denominated debts um, are increasing um, and their payments towards the U.S. increase. But when the dollar decreases in strength or it's kind of deflationary, well, one, it creates more inflation for our economy. And then the Fed tends to cut rates and do these sorts of things, which causes our asset prices to rise, our economy to rise. And therefore, it's rising faster than their global economies. So then more dollars come into the U.S., <laughs> And so it just creates this cycle of the dollar continues to get stronger as more and more people become reliant on it. And so all of that liquidity creates kind of this cocktail he calls the dollar milkshake theory. He believes in, in what I would say is that um, a move away from the dollar is untenable unless we move to a gold standard. Overnight, he believes that the G7 countries are going to um, work together and just finger snap all of their debt away by saying the new price of gold is $20,000 an ounce. And so no one has debt anymore. That sort of resets the system. Gold goes to the moon and the players who have power now continue to be in power. Um, I think it's a bit short-sighted. I think that means that these G7 nations would have to trust each other. They would have to coordinate with each other. They would have to be able to settle. They would have to be able to audit and confirm who has how much gold. And I don't think that we're becoming friends with Russia or China anytime soon. I just, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that's likely. Um, but who knows? Maybe something crazy could happen. And so the dollar obesity theory coined by Preston Pish says that these smaller countries and economies are realizing that they can't escape the IMF or the dollar, and they're looking for ways out, like Bhutan, like El Salvador, and they're adopting an alternative system that Jeff Booth talks about uh, in Bitcoin. And then all of these sovereign nations, regardless of whether people believe it or not, they're sovereign because they, they have the majority of energy resources. So if it's Saudi Arabia, if it's Russia, 
um, if it's India, if it's the United States, um, the more likely situation would be for us to compete on an energy standard, which would be denominated in Bitcoin versus an oil standard or a gold standard. And so that's the dollar obesity theory. The dollar becomes so big, we have to protect the dollar in so many places that we just gorge ourselves on dollars. We just, we just, until we become a 500 pound person on the couch that can't move. And that's what ends up killing us. And gold won't be the winner at the end of that. Bitcoin will be the winner. So dollar milkshake theory, gold, dollar obesity theory, Bitcoin. I love that. I, I like how you break it down uh, also. Um, do, do you think that money eventually, like now we're in a weird state where there are so many different currencies, uh, so many different forms of money. You could even like uh, argue like, oh, like Bitcoin, there is a, a currency. Then we have the US dollars, we have Euro, then there's like BRICS thing. Then there's also so many small currencies, uh, like Egypt and all those those things. Um, but is it eventually uh, a winner takes it all of, of the whole whole earth? It's like one uh, money that, that rules all or is there like a chance that there might be a second one, a third one, uh, or like the, the fiat monetary system might actually stick around for a long time? I think in some form or fashion, it's going to stick around for a long time. I don't think Bitcoin becomes the, the thing that we trade in or we denominate things in. I think it becomes the measuring stick behind um, all of these different currencies. I, I believe that Bitcoin is the stable um non-fungible uh or or the fungible um non-manipulatable um thing that we determine as the baseline for pricing all of these other currencies in um and i believe that there will still continue to be a lot of currencies i believe that there's like 120 currencies out there or somewhere around that number that's just unfeasible and untenable um that number will shrink and that number will decrease um I believe that there is a real future and a real use case for stable coins. I'm not like a huge fan, um, but they are being used worldwide. It's just like undeniable, um, especially as you talk about this AI world and this AI future where a person works in Argentina, but they're a resident of another country um, and they're paying a contractor in another country somewhere else along across the world. like these things are not going to be interchanged across five currencies anymore. We're just going to use one currency, whether it's USDT um, or some other thing in order to kind of stabilize transactions. But I believe Bitcoin will be the reserve currency of the world. I do believe that. I don't believe it'll be the thing that we trade in or trade on. What is, uh, when, when this is the case and, and Bitcoin is, uh, no matter when this, this will happen, but when this actually happens and Bitcoin is the re world reserve currency, uh, or world reserve asset uh, that is behind it and is the measurement stick, what does that mean for the world? Like what impact does it have? Is that then uh, the whole world a little bit more capitalistic? Uh, is the, this, this government overreach uh, limited or how do you, how do you see that? Uh, I, I really, I'm like really hopeful for like this altruistic level playing field. Like I'm an athlete, right? Uh, I'm a former division one football player. Uh, my family, uh, my in-laws, like we're all, we're all athletes. I'm, I'm around sports all the time. Um, I'm really hopeful for this level playing field. Um, this new economic constitution being instituted by Bitcoin, where we all have the same rules that we play on. It's the same playing field. We have one referee and that is the Bitcoin protocol. And you put up points by generating and creating economic productivity and you are rewarded through sats. Um, like I really believe in this proof of work idea that the, the, the meritocracy and you just work hard, you create value and you're rewarded for that. Um, now here's where I think humanity tends to lend itself. Um, I'm a, um, I'm a Christian and so I've read the Bible and a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about the Bible and all of these things and whether they're true and what it promotes or what it doesn't. What it says to me 
is when you look at all of the wars and all of the corruption and all of the greed and all of the dictators and all of the slavery and all of the oppression that happens around the world, it feels like a pretty realistic recounting of human nature. Regardless of what you believe, you can look it through any history book and overlay that against the Bible and go, hmm, this actually looks like what people act like when they tend to get power, when they tend to get resources, when they tend to get a higher view of themselves. And ultimately, there are these cycles where these nations are at war. And now it's not tribe versus tribe. It's Iran versus Israel in nuclear wars. It's China versus the United States, right? It's Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier, right? The, the fights have just gotten bigger and the scale by which people can inflict damage has gotten greater. And so I really hope that this world resets without a world war. But ultimately, whether it's Bitcoin happening through this meritocracy of the people that can harness the most energy and input it into the Bitcoin system, um, and we're all on a level playing field, or it happens via war, which I think is probably more likely the case, this hierarchy Maslow of like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like you have this triangle of, of at the top, there's all of these things that don't matter. And I think that's where we're at as a society. Like 50% of people's discretionary income is not on like food and housing and other things anymore. It's on like subscriptions to Netflix and DoorDash and all of these things that like at the end of the day, like I've got like 10 hoodies in here, like 10 Bitcoin hoodies, right? It's like, I only need one or two. And so when these resets happen, we reset as a human race back down that triangle of our needs. And what that does is it levels the playing field. It, it removes the excess of all of the things that we don't need. And that allows us to reset on a new standard. When that new standard is Bitcoin, we then begin to trade. We, be, we then begin to barter. We then begin to um, put new transactions onto this foundational layer based upon our merit and not upon our debt. It's the great debt jubilee, in my opinion. Um, and, it only, and it happens two ways. Um, it happens either we willingly choose this or it happens via war. Um, but in that new world and in that new standard, it's completely based upon the amount of value that you're able to generate and the amount of, um, the amount of, I think people globally that you're able to connect with to exchange value with. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step and if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first 
ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. And those two ways are really interesting uh, when you look at them. Uh, as you said, like either we are just switching intentionally there or we have a war and i'm really conflicted with those two because both could be could be true but the more and more i see the difference between hardcore bitcoiners and the overall society i'm like there's such a big difference and there are such big forces that want to hang on to this feared world that it almost has to end up not peacefully or like some sort of war, some sort of conflict. It's it's really hard to uh, imagine a world where we slowly dive into that and it's a peaceful revolution, even though we talk a lot about that. But I have a hard time believing that it will be really peaceful uh, to, a certain, to a certain extent. I agree uh, with so. that. I mean, and, and I think we wrestle between these two these two states, right? You have apathy and then you have people that are kind of... Um, I would say controlled by the narratives and the media and what people are, are told. And so these are apathetic people in general, which is nothing's going to change anyway, or they're so blinded by maybe what they're told that they don't realize what's going on. And then there's the complete opposite side, which is full on narcissism and full on rebellion, which is, I think some maxis, Bitcoin maxis can get to the spot, which I don't think is a bad thing. But you get to this point to where you're always shaking your fists at the system and, you know, this isn't how things should work and it's not where it should go. And you can get so far into narcissism that um, it becomes unproductive. And I think you have to have this balance in between. And I think Bitcoin, this is the thing that I'm trying to get across to people. It has the ability to help you accomplish both. Because you can get the life-changing returns of playing the game how it's traditionally been played. When you look at the compound annual growth rates of Bitcoin, you know, Michael Saylor says since 2013, it's what, I don't know, 46% or whatever he used in his last uh, presentation. The compound annual growth rate, when you go back to 2013, if you look at any four-year period, it's never gone below the low 20% rate. And so you have this asset that is like a high beta stock, like NVIDIA or Amazon in terms of its returns, you have the commodity profile of gold or copper or some of these other things that's actually designated as a commodity by the SEC, the CFTC and the IRS if you live in the United States. So they actually say it's a commodity and property. And then, you also have the ability to secure and store it for much cheaper than you could with gold. And so I don't, I, I guess I don't understand the play for not getting Bitcoin because you can play the game better than the people who are playing the game with the returns, but you can also get the sovereignty and you can get the benefits of being fully sovereign and fully in control of your destiny with Bitcoin by writing down 12 or 24 words or multi-sig or, you know, uh, geographical, you know, dispersed custody, right? These sorts of ideas that are not that hard to implement. Like we're not talking about rocket science where you could get all of the benefits and beat them at their own game. So I just don't understand for people like you, you have all the options in the world now that you can own real Bitcoin and have greater returns. And if you do enough study, you do enough homework, you run your own node, you hold your own keys, you're ready for the bunker days too. I don't know why it has to be this, you know, this fight back and forth. You can be apathetic and yeah, this is how the world's going to continue to go. And you can also shake your fist, buy Bitcoin and put it in self-custody. It's interesting. It's also, I feel like that some, a lot of people uh, that have problems coming into the Bitcoin world are frightened by this volatility. 
this this like up and down volatility and it's it's so interesting uh i recently uh posted a, a chart of the four year moving average bitcoin price and this completely smooths it out and it's just like a straight line up and it's such a, a beautiful thing and you also said to me before i i don't remember if it was recorded or or uh before we recorded but you said you're also big on uh teaching people how to zoom out and, and not being too much in the moment but zooming out with the bitcoin price why is that so hard for people and why is it so important to, to zoom out um well one i think it's because when you hear the narratives and some of it is intentional i want to be very clear the mainstream media uh the ross sorkins of the world um anyone who gets um, a platform that is of the mainstream will always use the term speculative, right? So some of it is, I think, intentional training um, against Bitcoin. I don't think it's a coincidence that they all use the same word. Just like I don't think it's coincidence that, um, that you know, Kamala Harris says that she grew up middle class in every interview that she has, right? There's a message that she's trying to communicate. It's like, what, what, how's the weather today? I grew up in the middle class. It's like, this has nothing to do with the question. But so at some point, it is intentional that they want to, um, I think, create this narrative around Bitcoin as it's a speculative, volatile, casino-like asset. And I actually ran some of the numbers on this. Uh, I actually did this for one of my recent shows. Let me, let me pull this up. I'm not going to put it on my screen, but I just need to get it on my own notes. Um, so I just wanted to like, I always help people to think like, don't think intra-year, think calendar year and multi-year in terms of the returns of Bitcoin. And so when you look at this, give me one second here. I ran some numbers on the likelihood of winning in a particular game at the casino. And so if you look at the numbers, uh, your likelihood of winning in slots is 40%. Next is roulette at 44.7%. The next is Let It Ride at 46.5%. The next is Poker at 46.6%. The next is Blackjack at 48%. And then the highest opportunity to beat the house uh, is Craps at 48.6% or Baccarat at 48.8%. So almost a 50-50 edge, but the house still has the edge. And so when you look at Bitcoin, uh, I ran the numbers and I pulled the daily price um, returns all the way back to 2013 uh, because the numbers would be even crazier and bigger if you go back past 2013. Um, so I just for people to not have their faces melted off, uh, I just stop at 2013. And so um, for Bitcoin, your odds of winning in the casino are 96.06%, meaning that if you hold Bitcoin for any four year period, within this time frame of 2013 through today, you have a 96.06% chance of a positive return. And so if you hold it for one year, your probability of positive return is 70.3% with the average return being 90%. This is going back to that time, that time period, the average returns, right? So we're, we're not looking at the compound, just the average. The two-year holding period, at 79%, with the average return being 233%. The three-year holding period, the probability of a positive return is 90%, with the average returns being 565%. And the four-year holding period, again, it's 96%, with the average return being 1,100%. So it's actually not like a casino at all. Uh, and a lot of people get caught in these intraday returns. And when you look at any five-day stretch, it's it's actually really interesting between today, October 1st, 2014, or 2024, happy October, everybody, and going back to October 1st of 2014, you actually have, at any five-day period, the highest amount of drawdowns that you see is like 48%. But the five-day upside volatility, the number one ranking day or five-day stretch is 61%. So Bitcoin has a lot of these downward drawdowns, but the upward volatility is so much higher, it's so much greater, and it's so much faster. And when you zoom out to these four-year cycles, 
it, it's a pattern at this point, right? You call it luck once, okay, twice, okay, you've ha you're having a good day. Three times in a row where I see three down year or three up years, one down year, um, it's it's a pattern. And that's what we're seeing play out. And so for all the people out there that think Bitcoin is a casino, it's speculative, and it's gambling, well, the data and the numbers don't suggest that whatsoever. I don't understand how that could be the narrative if you want to take five minutes to do the effort. It, it's also interesting. Most people who say uh, Bitcoin is speculative then go ahead and invest in lottery tickets <laughs> and then go ahead and, and, and play in, in casinos li like that or invest in some extremely small uh, start uh, uh, just like started up on the on the stock exchange small startup because it's not the the main name and it's like sounds fancy and stuff like that. It's it's I see it all over with with my friends. Maybe that's just subjective, but I see it with so many people who are like, oh no, Bitcoin is too speculative, too volatile, and then they're doing all those things that are way more speculative, way more risky, way more uh, volatile than, than Bitcoin ever was so that's 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 one thing and and the zooming out is is so important i love the few hours with like uh comparing the numbers of like blackjack i think was the 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 highest return that i remembered the other two games that were higher i, I don't even know about them <laughs> but blackjack uh I, I know uh that that's really interesting and i think it it helps people to to think about bitcoin not in that speculative way and to think about bitcoin as what it actually is when you look at the numbers and not just like headlines and narratives that other people might want you uh, to, to, to believe in. I, I love that uh, input of yours. Really cool. Uh, I mean, uh, and it, yeah, I mean, and one other thing too, I think one, other, I mean, you had uh, Leon on your podcast a few episodes ago, and I think people are now waking up to this idea that real estate is more speculative than they thought. And, and even in the United States, like my mom lives in North Carolina and she hasn't had power since Wednesday night or Thursday um, from from the from the latest hurricane and entire towns. Um, and again, this is a threat of, you know, what Michael Saylor calls an act of God or natural disaster. But we have, you know, several cases of this within the last 20 years with Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ian, and now Hurricane Helene, it's sort of like, yeah, this isn't a statistical improbability. This is almost a statistical probability that if you live within a certain zone or a certain region that could be mountainous, it could be completely detached from the ocean. Some of these places that have been wrecked, like Tennessee or, or these other places in, in you know North Carolina on the on the western side, are not close to the ocean, what you would typically consider places to be in a hurricane flood zone. And so people have to really begin to ask questions about, is real estate um, as protected of an asset class or um, resistant to um, disaster or risk that I thought it was? Uh, real estate is, uh, is a big one. It's also for me, um, people see it, especially in Austria, I don't know how it's in, in America, but also a lot of people see real estate as their personal savings account. It's still like, oh, like, I, I just buy a house, live in that, pay the mortgage for like 30 years. And, and that's it. That's my investment strategy for my whole life. Uh, and it played out not that bad in, in uh, before Bitcoin. Uh, because real estate was a good asset, uh, but you had to deal with a lot of things. And then you had the risk of, uh, as you said, like the natural disasters and stuff like that. But for me, real estate is a business. Like, uh, I don't know why we, <laughs> we even, uh, have to compare, uh, real estate with Bitcoin because real estate is not, a, not an investment. It's just a business that you have to, where you get income, uh, the savings that we have with Bitcoin, there is no income from that. Like th th there should not be a yield on that. It's interesting for me how people can confuse those. Well, I mean, they say, oh, you can't spend your Bitcoin. I mean, I don't know if you saw this yesterday or two days ago, the state of Ohio actually will allow people to pay their taxes, their state uh, state taxes in Bitcoin. Um, but it's like, you don't pay for things with your bedroom either. Uh, no, what people do is they take a home equity line of credit out in the United States, a second mortgage, and 
they get cash from the appraised value of this house, which again is a subjective measure that they then take the cash out of and then use it to renovate or to update or to buy more stocks or other things. And so the cash value or the appraised value of their house continues to go up. And so it's it's kind of like a renewable, this renewable cash balance that then they then withdraw to then use in the real world in the economy. And so it's stored up from their house. But in Bitcoin, that same paradigm is coming. You're going to be able to borrow against your Bitcoin, just like you do a home equity line of credit. Because here's the thing, the home equity line of credit has a quote unquote appraised value. And when home prices come down, the banks are going to come say, oh, we need a new appraisal because that value doesn't look the same. And then those assets are at risk. Um, And then the kind of the last thing there from a bank, from a collateral standpoint, do you want to come to somebody's house with, you know, dog, the repo man, the bounty hunter? He's a famous bounty hunter in the United States. His name's dog, the bounty hunter. Um, Do you want to come to somebody's house with dog, the bounty hunter, force their family out, liquidate all their furniture on Facebook marketplace? Or do you want to sign a transaction in a multi-sig that gives you the rights to that property if someone defaults? I think every bank in America from a cost and a ability to capture that asset value would say Bitcoin 10 times out of 10. Yeah, it's interesting why it's not already there. It's, it's like already uh, the, the most pristine collateral Bitcoin. I mean, of course, we need time to like get to the state where everyone gets it and those, those products has, have to develop. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a no brainer for me to, to have Bitcoin as collateral. Uh, you have a multi-signature uh, solutions where you can do multi sig with the bank and uh, third party and all those things. Like it's, it's, uh, it's quite easy also to like, not quite easy, but it's 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 relatively easy to set up, uh, and and you don't need, as you said, with the house, you don't have to force people out. One thing that I want to get also in, uh, you you mentioned Camilla, and then I thought like, how big do you think it is that uh, Trump and RFK and Vivek Ramaswamy, that kind of uh, administration, um, that might even be the a future administration when Trump wins that there are actually Bitcoiners in there. I mean, we can <laughs> discuss how, how much of a Bitcoiner tr- Donald Trump is, but I think RFK is already way deeper in there. And Vivek Ramaswamy maybe also. How big is it for America and then also for the world that there are those Bitcoiners uh, or on the journey to being Bitcoiners uh, in the administration? It's huge. Um, I, I personally don't think that... Um... Donald is a real, real big Bitcoiner. Um, he's got his, uh, his, his Liberty DeFi token or whatever that's out. And I'm like, man, he couldn't have waited like two weeks or three weeks um, in order to launch this. It just doesn't look very good. But the people on his team and in his cabinet, like you mentioned, uh, Vivek, you mentioned RFK, um, you know, JD Vance and others, these people are, are, are serious about Bitcoin and Bitcoin innovation. And I think more importantly than just even Bitcoin, energy dominance, um, removing ourselves, you know, you actually just saw um, Donald Trump um, with, uh, he did doing an interview with Zelensky from Ukraine, right? Kind of shrinking the size of the military industrial complex. He's made comments and remarks out there about um, decreasing the strength of the dollar um, by not meddling in other places in the world and the country. And like to his point, his hat, right? Make America great again. I think it has major implications for the rest of the world um, as as America sets the standard for what happens in the financial markets. Regardless of what people like to think, like America, our number one export is financial services, right? We are We are the financial engine of the world. Um, and so I think it has massive implications for, uh, probably not like Bitcoin specifically, but all of the things around Bitcoin, are we going to start building nuclear reactors? Are we going to start investing into energy resources? Are we going to become the dominant player in chip manufacturing, or is that going to kind of continue to live in the Eastern part of the world? Those sorts of things for America specifically, because that's the context I'm speaking from are really critical. I I'm. I have pretty strong feelings that the Democratic elected party, 
<clears throat> does not believe the same things. Um, and so we're going to probably see several different futures, kind of binary outcomes um, in terms of energy dominance and Bitcoin um, based upon which party is elected. And um, I don't think Donald himself is a real Bitcoiner. He, he, he might be, I think, uh, I think Max Kaiser was like this, this stage model where you are on stage one and you want to fix Bitcoin and you have your own uh, shit coin. It's like he, he's on, on stage one and uh, maybe, maybe in the four year administration, uh, with, with RFK, with, with, with JD Vance, with maybe other people that come into the administration and Bitcoin is influencing him along the way. Uh, maybe he, he gets to, to the point, but, uh, for Bitcoin, not that important, but it would be interesting for America as, as, uh, as America is, as you said, all of the financial services. And they had yesterday a talk uh, with, uh, 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 Chris from CoinShares about that, that the Bitcoin ETF is such a huge thing in America uh, and in the world, actually, like everyone paid attention to Bitcoin ETF. But in Europe, since 2015, there's a Bitcoin ETP, which, which is basically an ETF, but they, they cannot call it ETF. Um, and they even like have a really nice product where you can take uh, physical delivery of your Bitcoin directly and not cash. Uh, which is not possible with the American one. So it's it's interesting, like when, when America does something, the whole world listens and it has actually a, a big weight on it. So uh, America being more and more Bitcoin friendly and more and more Bitcoin focused, also in the political discussion, is something that will influence EU and will influence all the other places as as I see it. So I think it's a, a as you said, like a, a, a huge uh, impact. I, I really love what you were saying about that. Um, perfect. Then uh, we we come closer to the end routine uh, of, of of our podcast. Uh, one question that I always ask all my guests is, what can we learn from you besides uh, Bitcoin? Uh, you guys, what my life philosophies now. Um... I would say um, things. So um, I recognize um, our society has put a great deal of weight, importance, and attention on content creators and influencers, and it's very top heavy. And I want to send a message to all of those folks out there because um, I'm I'm kind of now one of those people, one of the content creators, the YouTube guys, whatever that is. I always tell people. The people that comment um, on your YouTube videos or your podcast online are not the same people that will make remarks at your funeral. And, and I want people to understand that distinction that it's probably better to be more famous in your neighborhood than it is to be more famous on your social network. And I, 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 um, I want to ask people, like, you've listened to you know, a hundred hours of, of Jeff Booth or, or me or, or anyone else, you know, do you know your neighbors? Um, do you have a set of parents and, and people, if you're a parent, um, that you're, you're so tight with that you can avoid what Jonathan Haidt calls this anxious generation dilemma, where the rate of suicide and the rate of depression and, um, anxiety disorders has kind of skyrocketed since 2013 and 2012 when Instagram came out. And the lowest common denominator or the weakest link in your parent group or friend group is going to be what causes your kids and your friends to go down that rabbit hole, which we know isn't good for them. Do you know your community? Do you know your neighbors? Do they know you? And then lastly, you know, how are we going to solve our future generation's problem if there is no future generation. So um, I, I just want to like really encourage people, if you're afraid, if you're fearful, maybe if you don't feel like you have the money or the time, those are unfounded fears when it comes to having children. Because your children actually make you more economically productive. Talk yourself up. You can listen to every Hormozy podcast, Every Huberman podcast out there, get in a cold tub, run five miles, but there's nothing that gets you and force you to grind harder than a crying baby. So those are a couple of thoughts, unfounded. People can have them, take them, relieve them, but that's kind of my thoughts outside of Bitcoin. 
I love that a lot. And it's interesting because if uh, you just think like, uh, from from like the first thought is like oh yeah like kids that they they cost that much like you have this figures like a kid cost half a million or a million whatever figure you're looking at and uh, then people go ahead like oh I cannot uh, <laughs> I cannot uh, afford a kid but then you have all those examples of people that have kids and have family and have those values and they are super successful it, that, there's like a correlation between them having kids, family, and, and and marriage, and all those things, versus uh, them not having that. And the other, the first one is just way more successful. I mean, <laughs> the poster child of that is Elon Musk with twelve kids. I guess uh, he he's super successful and he has twelve kids. Uh, and there there is a, I think that this the this this having this inner urge to provide for some other human beings that is not yourself. And that is something bigger than yourself. It, it's, it's really interesting how this this drives you to to grind harder. I cannot understand it because I don't have a kids, but I observe that with so many other people, and uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. And uh, as w- one of my other guests uh, said, "Make more babies." This is like one, one of the, the slogans of Bitcoin, as I guess. And I love that you brought it also in the podcast. There, thank you so much for, for that, Dante. Uh, really cool. Um, bef- now we have an end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And it's about digital identities. What would the world look like if we can control our own digital identities? Uh, I just so you have context to the question. Uh, this was the guy who is right now in El Salvador and trying that with a hospital to put the identities on Nostra, which is a really interesting uh, uh, starting project. I forgot how this uh, protocol uh, is called. I think it's Salute Protocol or something like that. That's built on Nostra. It's an interesting, uh, very, 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 very early stage uh, thing. Um, but the general idea is like not the hospital and medical uh, or the, any other institution has the, has the data, but you have your own data and you can give it to the institution if they want to. W- what do you think about that? I think it's really important. We didn't get into this in the AI discussion, but Jensen Wong from NVIDIA, NVIDIA CEO, said that the ability for AI bots and agents to create fake data, fake content, fake news, and fake information is going to increase at a rate that's exponential that we don't have the ability to believe. His solution, which I thought was ironic for someone who's selling chips, was we need AI agents to defend against the other AI agents. I'm like, okay, (laughs) okay, that's convenient for you to say. But the reality of what Bob Burnett is talking about um, with this, uh, you know, randomness engine um, from Barefoot Mining, the, the, the innovation of Bitcoin is digital costliness right? There has to be a cost to create and maintain a digital record of what happened in the past. And if there isn't a cost, then we're in a world full of hurt and trouble, especially with deep fakes and AIs and everything else. So I think it's incredibly important for Bitcoin to be this foundational layer. Now, I believe that there's going to be other protocols on top of it, you know, um, layer twos, different things that peg in and out of Bitcoin that are not, you know, taking, you know, space from, you know, the mempool or the blockchain itself or block space. Um, But it's incredibly important. There need to be people who are thinking about it. Um, How do we actually have a verified record that you are who you say you are? This is what you said. And this is what happened on this date and time, not verified by the winners and who get to rewrite history, but verified by this non- you know, judgmental third party objective protocol called Bitcoin. Super important. Really, really cool. I love, I love, I love that view. Um, thank you so much, Dante, for being on my show. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions and, and see more about you? Follow me on Twitter at Dante underscore cook one. And you can um, subscribe to the Simply Bitcoin um, YouTube channel. I'll be creating content on there at least three days a week and hopefully more moving forward. Really cool. Perfect. And thank you so much for your time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. Uh, As always, I'll be back uh, tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.